There's a transition for you. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Uh, welcome to our Good Friday service. This is a special, very special service for us. Uh, one where we dedicate an evening together just to reflect on our Lord's death for us. We talk about it all the time. We thank God for Christ's death every day. Seldom do we dedicate an entire evening to just think about the magnitude of his death and the significance of his death for us. So as we've designed this service, it's inevitably it will be a somber service uh, just because you can't think about what the Lord has done for us in sending his son into the world to die a gruesome death by crucifixion. We can't think about that without some measure of sobriety, but at the same time, we hope that you won't leave here depressed thinking that Jesus is dead, because he's not dead. He is alive, all right? We know Sunday is coming. The resurrection is coming, uh, but tonight, we want to think about his crucifixion, and the hope is that we can all, as we think about these passages, as we think about these songs, that we can maybe get a greater understanding of just what it means that Christ was willing to die for us, then part of the joy of it all, the sobriety is there, but part of the joy of it all is that we understand that this is the demonstration of the Father's love for His people. All we're going to be looking at tonight is God demonstrating His love for His people. His hatred of sin as well, sure, but also and primarily His love for His own. So, Sobriety, but joy, joy and worship. Now, 700 years before the death of Christ, the prophet Isaiah wrote about his death, what it would be like 700 years before it happened. And this is what the prophet Isaiah said. Isaiah 52, beginning verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told of them, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand. Verse 1 of chapter 53, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom mid men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. 
Verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what a striking and sobering passage that our Lord was willing to undergo the stroke due for us. In love, He stood in the gap on our behalf. In love, He bore Your wrath. In love, He endured the cross. All, Father, because it was Your perfect will. And all because of His relentless commitment to uphold Your plan to redeem a people for Your name's sake. And so, Father, as we gather here tonight as those transgressors who should have received the stroke that we're going to read about and sing about tonight that our Lord received. Father, we pray that you would meet us here, that our eyes would be wide open to see Christ, to behold Him, to look at what He did for us. And Lord, may you fill our hearts with sobriety as we see the pain and the cost of our sin, but at the same time, Lord, fill us with joy as we see the lengths to which our Lord was willing to go to save us and to redeem us from sin and lawlessness and to reconcile us to you. And Father, we ask that you would be honored by this service, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Begin in Luke 18. Then Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and mistreated, and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But his disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. From Luke 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put Jesus to death. For they were afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters, and you shall say to the owner of that house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and they found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Yeah. 
Even though Jesus had foretold of his death, the disciples did not yet understand what Jesus was going to do on their behalf. As they traveled to Jerusalem, Jesus continued teaching and preparing his disciples for what was about to happen. From John 13, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, and Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which with, with which he girded himself. So he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him, and it is for this reason he said, not all of you are clean.
We come now to the Lord's table, which is a special form of worship that Jesus instituted before his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. He knew that his death was coming quickly. He knew uh, what he would accomplish in his death, uh, and for the joy that was set before him, he endured it all. But he also knew that his disciples would have a difficult road ahead of them. Uh, he knew they were prone to forgetfulness, uh, prone to failure, uh, prone to lose sight of the purpose of their lives, the purpose of their redemption, uh, the purpose of the kingdom. And so he instituted something like an object lesson for them and for us today as a way of setting before his men and his disciples in perpetuity what he was accomplishing through his death. In the bread, we're able to see and taste the body of Jesus that was broken for us. In the blood, or in the cup rather, we see and taste the blood of Jesus that was spilled out for sinners like you and me. And the lesson is powerful in a number of ways, which is the nature of an object lesson. Uh, but it's powerful in one significant way that we like to think about every time we partake of the Lord's table. And it's this. This is a way for us to taste and see what Christ has done for us. We look with the eye of faith. That's how we see, right? Though we have not seen him, we love him. But in the Lord's table, we get to see the blood and the body, and we also get to taste it. And as surely as we can taste it, so surely has Christ died and paid the debt for your sin. So it's powerful in that it's tangible for us to touch, and this is the only thing like that we have. Baptism is similar, but as a perpetual rem remembrance of the death of Christ, this is unique. So in this, we observe the Lord's table, we remember and we proclaim. We remember what He did for us and we proclaim His death on our behalf until He returns. But there's a third element there. We also rejoice, right? This is a somber reflection of Christ's death. But it was meant to be a time of rejoicing as well. That your sins, though they are dark and many and complicated and cause all sorts of strife in your family and in your relationships, they're covered. The debt has been paid. And this is a reminder for us that Jesus paid the debt. He made the sacrifice for us so that we could be free and be his holy people and not live with the albatross of sin around our neck all the time robbing us of joy in this life. So we remember, we reflect, we proclaim, and we rejoice, all right? In keeping with Scripture, though, I need to lay out a few warnings for us. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven 27 to 29, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, wrote this, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the blood and the body of the Lord. That's powerful. Powerful. Therefore, verse 28, a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, he says, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Stern warning to the church. Reminds us that in this observation, certainly we're observing and remembering the Lord's death, but there is a heightened level of sobriety when we come to this table. To such an extent that some people in Corinth were receiving the judgment of God for failing to eat and drink appropriately. 
It's a reminder also that this is not Calvary Bible Church's table. This is not my table. This is not the elders' table. This is the Lord Jesus' table. He sets the rules. It's his life. It's his death. It's his blood poured out. And so he is the one who tells us how we are to come. And he says we're to do so in a worthy manner. Not that we clean ourselves up. We know we can't do that. It's not that we clean ourselves up before we come and enjoy the fruit of the gospel. But we come having prepared our hearts. That's the idea. And let me tell you what that looks like. It looks There's a couple of aspects of heart preparation uh, that you will either... Um, carry out and so drink and eat in a worthy way, or if you don't do that, you will drink in an unworthy manner. And I would say, if you're not sure about that, let the cup pass. But let me tell you what that looks like. Number one, to drink in an unworthy manner would mean that you are living in unrepentant sin knowingly. You know the sin is there. Uh, You keep it in your back pocket or you've hidden it under the covers or you've hidden it in the, you know, the darkness of your own home. You know it's there, but you're not repenting of it. The Lord is causing your conscience to go off uh, because He's showing you this is sin, this is sin, this is sin, and you keep saying, I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. That's to live in unrepentant sin. And if that's you, rather than enjoy the fruit of the gospel, you need to cry out to the Lord to forgive you of your lack of repentance. And He will. He will pardon you. So that's one way, living in unrepentant sin. Another way uh, to drink of the cup in an unworthy manner is to live in this church with unreconciled relationships. So if you are aware that you have sin, there is sin, your part on the part of someone else, that's standing between you and another brother or sister in the church. Jesus prizes unity in his body to such an extent That he tells you, if you proceed as if all is well, and you're living in unrepentant, unreconciled relationship with someone else, you will receive his hand of discipline. And so for your sake, if you are in an unreconciled relationship with someone in this church, the Lord Jesus would tell you, not me, the Lord Jesus would tell you, go and be reconciled to that person. Let the cup pass, and as soon as this service is over, Go and be reconciled. And if you need help with that, there are elders here and there are other godly people here that can help you work that out. Okay? But for your sake, don't partake of the elements if you are living in unrepentant sin or if you're living in an unreconciled relationship with someone else. Now, you don't have to be a member at Calvary because, again, this is not Calvary's table. This is the Lord's table, but you do have to be a repentant follower of Christ. Right? You have to confess Jesus as your Lord and submit to Him uh, and His will and His way for your life. If that's you, then we would say you are welcome to participate with us. And again, we would urge caution on, for mom and dad. Just um, monitor your children and make sure that they are proceeding in a way that's honoring to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you soberly with the understanding that we don't deserve to come to this table. Father, we don't deserve to come to you, period. Yet because of your covenant love to us, you sent your son to be the propitiation, the substitutionary wrath-bearing sacrifice for us. And it's only because of his death that we have any hope of pardon. And it's only because of his resurrection and intercession for us that we have the audacity to come to you now and ask that you would bless us as we observe this table. Father, we pray that you would help us to drink and eat in a worthy manner, that our hearts would be full of Christ's joy and that our minds would be full of and enriched by the reality of what Christ has done for us. And Father, that we would be honoring to you as we proceed. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
3, the Apostle Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took the bread.
Scripture says that when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, he said, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that after they had finished this meal, Jesus said to them, I say to you, glorious truth, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Scripture also says that after they had finished the meal, they closed with a hymn. Why don't you stand with me and we'll sing the doxology together. Jesus had explained that one of his disciples would betray him. Even this they could not understand. After the Passover meal was finished, Jesus rose and took his disciples out into the night. From Matthew 26. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father... If this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, 
the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, and let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Continuing in Matthew 26, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him had given them a sign, saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately, Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Jesus was led away to Caiaphas, where the scribes and the elders were gathered. There he was accused with false testimony he was slapped and spit upon. He was even denied by Peter, his own disciple. After being accused of blasphemy, Jesus was led before Pilate for sentencing. Let's stand and let's sing when I survey the wondrous cross. Bye. 
Matthew 27. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. really true I heard the crowd shouting crucify crucify I 
made my way through their cries. Oh, how loud were their cheers. I looked up to see. Oh, what I had feared. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the Praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they pushed it onto his head. 
and a reed they put in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. From Matthew 27. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You, who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. smitten and afflicted see him dying on the tree tis the Christ by man rejected yes my soul tis he tis he tis the long expected prophet David's son yet David's Lord by his son God now has spoken tis the true and faithful
continue in Matthew 27. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God.
Come, O oh sinner, come rejoice. Mercy fills this place of scorn. For he dies to save his enemies, that all who draw near may know his peace. Come, O oh sinner, come rejoice. Through the death of Christ, death is destroyed. Where our Savior bleeds, oh, the power of the love of God, come and stand in awe, oh, the wonder of this awesome scene, where our Savior approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a large stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Let's pray. Father, we know this is where Good Friday ends. Our Lord in a tomb, dark, disciples hopeless, confounded, confused. Father, likely contemplating what fools they have been, perhaps, to follow Christ. Yet, Father, we know that this is not the end. And our joy tonight is in the resurrected Christ. And, Father, we are struck at the links that you went, that our Lord went, to redeem a people sold into sin, hopeless, rebellious, uh, wanting nothing to do with you, wanting to be the Lord and Savior and kings of our own existence. Yet you, because of the greatness of your love, pursued us when we were running hard away from you. We had no thought of you, no desire for you. We were not righteous. Our lives were oriented away from you, hostile to you. Yet, Father, for your sake, only for your glory in the ultimate sense, you chose to demonstrate you, your love, the greatness of your love, to people like us by designing that your son would undergo the most humiliating path, the most shameful circumstances, the most gruesome death for us. And Lord, this is astounding to us. It is wonderful to us. And Lord, we confess that we have not even begun to grasp the height, the half of what it means that Jesus was willing to leave heaven to come to earth and to be humiliated, scorned, mistreated, accosted, slapped, spat upon, 
to have his beard plucked out. Father, all for the sake of love. And love for you in the ultimate sense and love for us in the horizontal sense. And Father, we praise you tonight that our Lord was willing to do that for us. Without that, Father, we have no hope and we are still in our sins. But with it, Lord, and with the resurrection, we have not only life everlasting, but hope, confidence that one day this world will become the kingdom of Christ. And He will come back not to be mistreated, not to die, but to reign and establish heaven on earth. And Lord, we pray that you would hasten that day. And Father, as we go through this weekend, looking forward to Sunday, help us, Lord, to not lose the taste of the bitterness of Christ's death, but at the same time, to have an eye open to the resurrection, lest we live one day of our lives without hope. We don't want to do that, but Lord, we want to be sufficiently humbled. So Lord, we pray, carry us through this weekend. Help us to be ready for Sunday to rejoice and stand in worship with hearts full and minds engaged as we celebrate the life, the resurrection of our Lord. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.